The Apostle John, in his Gospel, in the 14th chapter, 12th verse, says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. So picture this. Here's Jesus, moments away from going to the cross, and he's talking to his disciples, and All of a sudden, this question arises about wanting to see the Father, and Jesus points to himself and says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he goes on and says, whoever believes in me will do the works. Now, many of us have grown up within a tradition, a Christian tradition that has heard that term works in a negative context, that it's it's, we have to be watchful of works-based religion or, or works that lead to salvation. And unfortunately, we have associated this negative connotation with this word work when Jesus himself says, if you believe in me, he says, you'll do the work I've been doing and that they will do even greater things because I'm going to the Father, which means that we get to actually participate in the work of Jesus. And you think about Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where it says that we are God's workmanship, or or his masterpiece, created to do, there it is again, good works, that he prepared in advance for us to do. And so we're going to be ending this three-week series on practicing the way of Jesus, talking about what does it look like to do what Jesus did. And so we've been looking at these three different goals that a disciple would have as he entered into an apprenticeship of a rabbi, to be with his rabbi, to become like his rabbi, and to do what his rabbi did. And in the same way, Jesus invites us, anyone who would come to him, to do those same three goals, that we would be with Jesus. First and foremost, it's about an intimate relationship. It's what the New Testament authors call abiding. And then also... It's about becoming like him. It's our inner character and virtue and even our motivation being shaped into the character and priority of Christ. But all of that leads to something, that this relationship actually moves into our character and transformation, which then moves into our action and our behavior in the world around us. Because this world desperately is looking for what Jesus brought 2,000 years ago, it can't stop. And if it does, then we lose hope. And so I want to be looking at this theme of what does it mean to be doing what Jesus did, and also recognizing that's kind of an interesting question because most of us are not uh, a 30-year-old Jewish male rabbi. So we have to contextualize this question to really say, what does it mean for to do what Jesus did through you and your age and your personality type, where you live, uh, your age stage, all of, all of what makes up your occupation? What does it look like for Jesus to live his life through you? So five things the Bible tells us about doing what Jesus did. Number one is that the mission is expansive, meaning what Jesus did is probably bigger than you even understand. Secondly, the means in which he accomplished that mission are simple. The members are ordinary. The moments that we interact with are vital because his mercy is great. So we're going to work through these five different themes and to help us understand what does it mean to become like Jesus. And number one is understanding that the mission is expansive. So if I were to ask you, what is the mission of God right now? And you were to draw that up in your mind. My bet is whatever you think of the mission of God is, it's probably greater than that. You see, the story that God is telling is about the renewal of all things. It's a, it's a cosmological-sized problem that is being restored through Jesus. And it's about the incoming, the spilling over of God's rule and reign in this earth. And so it's, it's about... It's about salvation and discipleship and evangelism and mission, but it's, it's all of those things and more and more layers. 
of what Acts chapter 3 says. It is about the renewal or the restoration of everything. There's not one thing in creation that is not going to be touched by the work of Jesus. Meaning, everything we do matters. This is an expansive mission to bring about the renewal of all things. Recognizing that um, I don't even have to know who you are to recognize that you've already experienced the brokenness of this world. You've experienced trial, loss, grief, pain, disappointment, disillusionment, just by being human. So everyone would agree there's something wrong with the world. And at the same time, we also have to recognize that in the, in the name of human progress and, and in the name of goodwill, that humanity has made some significant steps in the right direction in the direction of things that we would say look like God's rule and reign. You think about political achievements and cultural masterpieces and technological advances. You think about the political shifts that have happened recently. When after World War II, the United Nations made the Declaration of Human Rights, where every human being has an inherent dignity and equal inalienable rights. You think about the The advent of democracy that Churchill says is the least worst form of government. You think about these steps and and what we would say add to human flourishing. You think about cultural masterpieces, whether it's Leonardo's Mona Lisa, whether it's Michelangelo's Pieta, whether it's the incredible work of authors like Shakespeare and Hemingway. You think about the beauty that's been added to the world through different artists. Think about technological advances. You think about what's happened um, from everything from travel to uh, from boats to cars and the invention of the airplane. You think about the advancements in medicine and what's happening in cancer research and uh, diabetic research and all of these things. And, And it would be easy to look back and we shouldn't take it for granted that there has been massive strides in Um, through the human species for the progress of human flourishing. All of that should be celebrated. And yet, when we experience what we experienced a couple of years ago, all of a sudden we also recognize that no matter how far we've progressed in our modern framework, there is still this thing within our culture, within our spirit, that seems like it still needs to be fixed. And the problem is we have tried to create a world and a worldview that says that we can bring about the kingdom without the king. It's language that Mark Sayers uses. And, and I think it does a great job describing it. Like we all want the kingdom. Who doesn't want a heavenly kingdom here on this earth? But we live in a culture that wants that kingdom without a king. But I think when you see humanity at its best, what you find is that when you want the kingdom with the king, you see some of the most beautiful and explosive steps towards the redemption of all things. One example, honestly, is who we're going to be celebrating this Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And he's become somewhat of a global icon of righteousness and revolution and bringing about what's good. But oftentimes what we fail to realize is that it was... It was MLK's faith that propelled him to bring about the incredible works of justice that he did. It's when those two things of a longing of a kingdom, it's the I have a dream speech that's fueled with that dream that was formed by the king that was central to Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. And so I wanted us just to realize that when we start talking about the mission of God, that it's, it's bigger than you imagine. But as much progress as we've made, there's still a long way to go. And the church has been taking heat. Christians have been taking heat and been called and labeled lots of things. I think recently, uh, I just want to go through just a few different lies that have come against Christians in the church. Lie number one is that came around this year is that Christians aren't really pro-life, they're just pro-birth. They don't care about babies after they're born. But interestingly enough, data says that, according to Barner Research Group, that Christians adopt more children than any other population segment, more than doubling the norm. Second lie that we hear is that Christians and the church are emotionally repressive and destructive to your mental health. 
But according to the Washington Post, regular church attendance dramatically improves your mental health. The only people in the U.S. whose mental health improved in 2020 were regular church attenders. Third lie is that Christians don't really care about or give towards the poor. Yet according to the Pew Research Center, which is not a Christian organization, it was church-going Christians who gave exponentially more towards the poor in a charitable donation. 65% of Christians versus only 43% of non-religious public. Fourth lie is that we see that the church is morally backwards and bad for society, yet Outreach Magazine in their report says that the higher the church attendance, the lower the burglary, larceny, robbery, assault, homicide, etc. We've heard that Christians are irrelevant and ideological and emotionally harmful to raising children, yet Christianity Today, a magazine found that regular church attendance significantly decreases the danger of adolescent depression, substance abuse, and sexual promiscuity. Next is that we hear a lot that the church doesn't really help your marriage or or chance of divorce. After all, isn't it 50% for those in and outside the church? But interestingly enough, the National Marriage Project, based on their research from a Harvard student, shows that committed Christians are less likely to get divorced by 35%. And the reason I'm bringing all that up is that as much as we want to celebrate human progress, it's not until we see human progress being attached to the king, the restorer of all things, through his means, which is the church, that we see something truly beautiful happen. And this is what we're invited into. To become like Jesus means we are a part of the restoration, the renewal of all things. Teresa of Avila says, Christ has no body now but yours, no hand and feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet and yours are the eyes. You are his body. And I love that because obviously we know that Christ's body, his scarred hands is sitting enthroned, but on the earth, we are his body to engage with that. But here's what's surprising. Our second point is not only is the mission expansive, but the means are actually quite simple. So one question we should ask is, what did Jesus do on the earth? And not to make it overly simplistic, but in Luke chapter 19, it says the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. But in Luke chapter 7, it says the Son of Man came eating and drinking. It seems to be that Jesus spent most of his time in relational settings, normally around a table or traveling to the next table that he would sit down at, engaging people whom the world had forgotten, labeled invisible or harmful. And it was through his eating and drinking that he came and brought restoration. It's incredibly simple. I mean, think about this. Jesus did not come and create some sort of master plan or write a bunch of philosophical books. He just came and was incarnationally with people. We can all do that. We can all follow this, this model. I love what Dallas Willard says. He says, there is, there is special evangelistic work to be done, of course, and there are special callings to it. But if those in the churches really are enjoying fullness of life, evangelism will be unstoppable and largely automatic. The local assembly, for its parts, can there become an academy where people throng from the surrounding community to learn how to live. It will be a school of life, for a disciple is but a pupil, a student, where all aspects of that life seen in, in the New Testament records are practices and mastered under those who have themselves mastered them through practice. Only by taking this as our immediate goal can we intend to carry out the Great Commission. So I just want to leave it. The, the means in which mission happens, us doing things in Jesus, is more simple you can imagine. Next, the members in which we do this are more ordinary than you can imagine. One of my favorite verses in all the New Testament is Acts chapter 4, 13. says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And I, I love the description of the people Jesus chose to change the world with. Were uneducated and ordinary. 
Now, this is coming from a guy who actually loves education. I love learning and researching and communicating. I love all of it. I love to nerd out on theology, but none of that, if I were to look at the pedigree that Jesus went after to welcome people in, it wasn't on there. It was the uneducated. It was the ordinary people. And so if you're watching this and, and you're like, well, I don't know if God could use me. I don't know if God would want to, to like really use my life in such a way like so-and-so or, or him or her. I just want to remind you the company that Jesus called to himself to be the greatest agents of the early church. It were the people that you probably least expect. So it's, it's more ordinary than we can imagine. I love what Andy Crouch says. Says being radical is actually pretty easy. Just give away 10% of your money and watch less TV, and that will make you a witness to the people around you. Michael Frost, in talking about our mission and us being sent, he says, Sentness is not just for missionaries to foreign lands. The shift is for all of us students and workers, parents and kids, professionals and laborers, artists and accountants, moms and mechanics. We are all sent into the world. We are given to those we relate to. We are commissioned to our workplace. We are placed in our streets. We are imagination. When our imaginations grasp our sentness, our life stories take a whole new dangerous meaning. So we have a, a mission that's expansive. We have means that are incredibly ordinary. We have members that are incredibly ordinary. But it's within the the ordinary, natural progression of it, that we have to understand its moments are vital. And this is where, kind of looping into last, last week, largely it's about us paying attention. It's paying attention to what God is up to in your work, where you spend, according to statistics, most of your waking life. It's paying attention to what the Spirit of God is doing when you're sitting around the table with your roommates or with your kids. It's it's paying attention to what God is doing on your vacation. It's, it's realizing that God is up to something. And it's when in our ordinary, sometimes uneducated, common state that we can hold the greatest impact to do what Jesus did. I love in Acts chapter 8, verse 27, Philip is, is prompted by God to go up to this royal official on his way back to Africa who ends up later getting baptized it says this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet the spirit told Philip go to that chariot and stay near it that that phrase the spirit told or the spirit spoke is used multiple times throughout the book of Acts describing the, these new Christians having their lives directed by the spirit speaking to them and so one of my encouragements to you is not that you have to go and buy a plane ticket and do something crazy, and, and maybe, unless God's asking you to do that, but I would actually encourage you to look at your life right now. If nothing changed in your schedule this week, other than your attentiveness to what the Spirit is doing, you might be surprised at how the kingdom of God is brought about because you've attached your life to the way of Jesus. This is why I think in Galatians chapter 5, it says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And I think if, if there was a prayer I would have for us as a community, is that we would be a community that keeps in step with the Spirit so that we can do what Jesus did, so that we can become like Jesus, and so that we can have all the richness of being with Jesus. Keep in step with the Spirit. Leslie Newbegin, who's um, the, the lay cultural anthropologist and missiologist, says, We must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. We do this by committing to the formative practices of God's kingdom, which then become the molding forces of our lives and the culture around us. What can that look like? And he gives some examples committed, vulnerable Christian relationships, faithful and fruitful lives, humble service of those around us, generosity of spirit and finances, a love for and knowledge of the scriptures, a hunger for his presence. And I love it. This is someone serving the culture 
largely in the 1950s and 60s, looking at the future of how we're going to reach the world. And he says, it's, this is actually quite ordinary stuff, but it's paying attention to what the kingdom is inviting us into and in the way that we live. And the last thing I just wanted to leave you with is that of all the things we talked about when it comes to doing what Jesus did, how the mission is expansive, yet the means are simple, the members are ordinary, the moments are vital, the last thing I just want to leave you with is that the mercy is great. If there was a fuel to get to drive us into the work of God, it is the fuel that is the grace of God. It is his love, his forgiveness, his mercy towards us, because once we grasp that, we don't have an option for that to spill over into the lives of those around us. Once we have been so loved and cared for by the incredible cruciform love of Jesus, it is those around us who become the recipients of that transformation. The thing about Luke 7, 47, it says, Therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. You see, we've, we've been forgiven much. It, it's, it is critical for us to consistently remember the magnitude in which we've been forgiven because those who've been forgiven much love much. We have to recognize the mercy of our God as the fuel that drives us into the expansive mission of God in 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 the means that are simple, the members that are ordinary, the moments that are critical. Oftentimes it just begins with love. So practically speaking, here's what I'd love for you to do this week. Um, first, I would, I would love for you just to pray and say, Lord, where in my life do you see me engaging those around me in a greater capacity with your kingdom and your mission? Secondly, I want you just to begin to start thinking about means that don't look like you going and like buying five books on apologetics and creating a whiteboard presentation for your coworkers. I want you to think about ordinary things, sharing a meal, having a conversation, carving margin in your time to be interrupted by the person who's hurting. Think about like, Lord, what are the things in my life where I can begin to be quite literally your hands and feet uh, for those around me. Uh, the second thing is for you to recognize that God wants you. He doesn't want some better version of you to start. He wants exactly who you are right now to begin to draw people's attention to the glory of God. The next thing is quite simple. is it's Maybe even set alarms in your phone if you'd like to, but try and pay attention to what God is doing. Here's the good news. We don't really bring God anywhere. God's already there. He's already up to something. It's our job to partner with what he's already up to in those spaces, to be attentive to his spirit, and then to obey with boldness and courage when he prompts our heart to love, to forgive, to, to be generous, to, to share, to evangelize, whatever he's putting on your heart. But all of that is fueled by the gospel. It's fueled by us being the beloved, us receiving that mercy, which interestingly enough goes back to the very first week. It's being with Jesus. And do you see how this is, it's less layers and more um, cyclical? It's more us recognizing that if we want to do what Jesus did, then we have to actually just be with him, receive his love. And as we're with him, we cannot help but begin to change and become like him, which will propel us into being who he did. Why do we want to do all this? Because Jesus of Nazareth, 2,000 years ago, looked at a bunch of ordinary, uneducated people, just like you and me, and said these words, follow me. And so if you've never done that, if you've never responded and answered to those questions of saying, yes, I'll follow you, I want to implore you just to open up your heart to see what God may be doing and even stirring within your heart this moment. Is he inviting you into that journey? According to scripture says that God desires that all should come to repentance and none should perish. Meaning that this invitation is for you. Can you hear the spirit beckoning you? 
And for those of us who maybe have heard that call yet have been distracted or discouraged or just tired, would we just invite the Holy Spirit just to wake us up and place within us a burning in our hearts to do what Jesus did? Father, we thank you. You've invited us into the incredible, beautiful, and important work of doing what you've done. We recognize, Lord Jesus, that this is not something that we've done because we're great, Lord God, or something, Lord Jesus, that we feel that we can do better uh, than anyone else, but we do this because of your greatness towards us and your grace towards us. Lord, I pray that we would be a church who cares desperately for the things you care about. Lord, I pray that we'd be a church who spends our time on the things you spent your time on. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that prioritizes things in such a way that looks very similar to how you prioritize things. Lord, help us pay attention. Lord, help us to be aware of what you are up to in our ordinary lives. I want to—I feel led to just pray specifically over our jobs. Lord, as we are around people, Lord God, or connected to people, or work for people, Lord Jesus, who otherwise we may never spend time with, would we recognize that maybe there's something more here than just earning an income or contributing to society, that there's something restorative you want us to do? Wake us up to that. The Holy Spirit, would you come? Lord, I pray for those who are responding to your call for the first time today, Lord Jesus, that you'd walk with them, fill them, Holy Spirit, immerse them in who you are. Lord, that they would just become regenerate, they would become new creations. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are and for inviting us into your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.